journalistic sources now will often make a statements like that about religion and science in combat uh, conflict or yeah. bad things about religion and history, and they appear to be frequently simply citing the likes of Dawkins, Harris, and some of these other new atheist people without knowing there's a problem with their scholarship. Well, okay, so why don't we move on to Europe up to 1600, and, and, and what were you trying to accomplish in this section? Well, that's <laughs> where I was dealing with the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and uh, period and so forth. And um, again, in the older views, again, basically Victorian 19th century views, um, the idea was that, that the Middle Ages were the Dark Ages. Um, you could almost use the terms uh, interchangeably, um, and that it was at the Renaissance there was a, a dawn of, uh, well, there was dawn, there was light after darkness, there was a rediscovery of the classics and so on. And again, all of that has has large elements of uh, truth, but it also um, uh, is is quite wrong um, in its view of the Middle Ages. And again, that's clearly established by mainstream historians who just mentioned the uh, the universities, for example. Uh, Parliament has its origins in the Middle Ages. Uh, modern agriculture has its origins in the Middle Ages. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't all superstition and uh, church dominated and blah, blah, blah. That was one of the things that annoyed me, that they would occasionally use the word theocracy for the Middle Ages. Well, theocracy is, is ruled by clerics, and, and that's not true. One of the main themes in the Middle Ages was the conflict between church authority and state authority. Um, this was not, not a unified society at all. There was a lot of tension there. Um, and um, they, they were quite oblivious to that. I pointed out one of the books they used by, was by William Manchester, who was a gifted writer. He wrote biographies of, of Kennedy and others and so on. He was a writer in residence down the river at Wesleyan University. Um, and almost as, a, as an aside, when he's working on something else, he wrote a little book uh, about um, the Renaissance. And uh, they they quoted extensively. It was called "A World Lit Only by Fire," and it it was uh, it had some some passages that, for those of us who do history, were laughable about um, how how dark the Middle Ages were and people kind of mindless whatever until the dawn of this new age. Well, this is um, this is very dated stuff, and um, that's an example of a book, and it was a bestseller very well written and so on, but really very bad history. Um, really? Not, not the kind of thing you, you would assign in, in a history course. William Manchester's, what was the book? Uh, it's, I always get it a little bit wrong. It's um, A World Lit Only by Fire. Um, I discuss it on page 81 and following in, in the book uh, and quote it. But again, what I was trying to show is that there view of the Middle Ages um, was very dated and distorted. They relied heavily on a William Manchester's A World Lit Only by Fire. And they grabbed his book, yeah, because it, it fit uh, it fit this old-fashioned narrative, even though it came out in the 1990s or <clears throat> early 90s, I think. Again, it was a, a well-written book. It's, it's a good read. It's just not very good history. Is there a good... Um response book for it or anything like that? Oh, no. I mean, it was reviewed, but you know, most medieval historians didn't take it seriously. And oh. any standard textbook on the Middle Ages, um, you would get a very different view. And again, it's not to paint the, the, the Middle Ages in any age in, in some sort of pure light. But um, the Middle Ages, you know, it's a long period of time for one thing. So there's a lot of developments there. But as we just mentioned, a lot of it, uh, a, a number of institutions, attitudes in the modern world have their roots in the Middle Ages. So it wasn't as if everything was bleak and dark and then there was suddenly this this burst of light in the 15th century. Okay, um, it was the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and all of a sudden we have thought again or something, right? Yeah, and you know, I used to tell my students, just think of the terms. 
uh, renaissance, you know, rebirth. It sounds like very po- enlightenment. And then you get, at, at best, the Middle Ages. You know, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it really came out of this idea that that was just the middle period between the glories of the ancient world and then the Renaissance. It's 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 a kind of carryover from some of the attitudes in the 15th and 16th century because they were they were very excited. They thought they were you know, getting rid of all this clerical stuff and rediscovering the ancient world, which in some ways they were. Mm-hmm. The You used the phrase dark ages. Um, uh, as somebody, I'm not a historian, but I love yeah. historian. Every time I hear the phrase dark ages, I want to pull my hair out. Yeah. Um, is it not true, sir, that the term dark ages isn't that much used anymore by historians and that it originally kind of was just talking about a period of history that was – like Latin was no longer being spoken, languages yeah. were everybody, and so it was hard yeah. to determine much history in that era. Isn't that really where the Dark Ages come from? Well, that's that's exactly right. No one, no historian would use the term Dark Ages to talk about the Middle Ages. We're we're kind of whether we like it or not, we're kind of stuck with the idea of the Middle Ages. You know, so we, we have to to live with it. And then you know, it, it's a thousand years long, so there there are a lot of developments within it. But <laughs> you're right if. Sometimes historians will talk about the Dark Ages in the terms of the early medieval period when, uh, as you say, um, uh, written stuff was going, uh, Latin was giving way to the vernacular spoken languages. Uh, There's often not a lot of uh, kind of solid evidence, particularly written literary evidence. Uh, So in that sense, it's dark in the sense of somewhat more obscure, a little harder to figure out in, in, in detail what's going on as compared to later when there's you know more documentation. Um, but even there, historians would be prone to put dark ages in, in quotation marks, you know, um, referring to that sort of thing, that, as, as you were saying. So in looking at the first three chapters, a uh, good summary is, let's see, they get the so-called dark ages, middle ages, they're sloppy, out of date, or just wrong up there. The period from the Enlightenment and Renaissance, a lot of outdated and hard to, um, uh, you know, just a lot of assertions they can't back up. And in the 20th century, they miss all kinds of stuff, too. Okay. Yeah. What we, what, t- tell me about the theme of the fourth chapter, History Out of Bounds. Well, that um, that chapter, uh, uh, I was trying to show, that, that's where I... I I gave it that title because I wanted to uh explore this idea I was talking to you about before that that you know they're they're not they're, they're not playing by the rules within the usual uh boundaries and <clears throat> I had followed very carefully uh I opened the chapter with uh recounting the um the uh, libel trial in London against uh Deborah Lipstadt American historian who uh, uh, wrote a very good book on on the Holocaust and and the Holocaust deniers, and uh, one of them, then uh, Englishman David Irving, sued her um, because she had mentioned him in the book. So in England, the libel laws are very different than here, and so she she was really behind the eight ball. She had to to sort of prove her innocence, so to speak. Well, anyway, I I, I give a couple pages to recounting that trial. Uh, which came out heavily in her favor um, and against David Irving as as a Holocaust denier and manipulator of history and so on. And I use that as an introduction because my argument there is that the new atheist way of doing history is on a par with Holocaust deniers. I'm very careful to point out that they do not deny the Holocaust. That's not the substance of what they say, no. But their their methods are similar. That's where you have this ideology. The the Holocaust deniers are trying to play down the idea of the systematic attempt to exterminate the Jews, Um, and they have all kinds of ways of, 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 of doing this. I've read a lot of their stuff. I used to teach some of it. Um, and I thought that's probably as strong an argument as I could make is to say, you guys are doing history. The way you do it is no better than Holocaust deniers. 
So that's so that's why I went back to the present. I I used to start it with 2000 with that libel trial, and then have a little section on. <clears throat> I used to teach historiography, the history of history and how it developed, and so on. And and again, trying to to show, I think, demonstrating that these people. Uh, are just outside the boundaries. They're they're doing something else. They're not doing history. Even but they use it, and of course, from my point of view, misuse it. I I know we're not here to talk about Holocaust deniers, but I know I'm going to be jumped on on this. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead. It, it's a subject yeah. that just perennially comes back. Would it be your position that none of the scholarship in the Holocaust revisionists is right, or is it another case of where, okay, sometimes they have a point, but really they're just sloppy and irresponsible? Uh, everything I've seen of, of their work, and I'll give you an example in a second of something pretty up close. Uh, they're apologists for the Nazis. They try to manipulate things, you know, oh, well, yeah, a lot of people died because there was disease and so on. The people who would have the most to gain by this view are the Germans, and they do not support this <laughs> at all. No historian does. I um, was in uh, Washington visiting my daughter in 1990, and the hotel I was in, it turned out, I, I picked up some talk in the elevator, and sure enough, the Institute of Historical Review, the Holocaust deniers, were having their annual get-together. And uh, I went downstairs where they, they were and looked at their literature, and I tried to talk my way in. And most of the stuff they had out, there was a lot of just plain uh, disgusting anti-Semitic stuff. Then they have a whole section of stuff on, you know, German memorabilia. You know, you, you too can get a SS uniform, uh, that kind of stuff. I literally had, when I said I was an historian, I wanted to go to one of their meetings, um, a security person come over uh, who was a blonde woman with a German accent. I mean, it was something like out of something out of a bad B movie. And David Irving, who later was in this trial, was the featured speaker on that occasion. And uh, the, the second featured speaker was John Toland. And as I mentioned before, Toland had written a book on FDR as a conspiring for the uh, Pearl Harbor. And the reason the historical, uh, the Holocaust scenarios like that as they pretended their organization was serious and was looking at other instances of conspiracies and bad history. So I have nothing good to say at all about these people. Um, I, 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 I find them quite contemptible. Um, and again, to keep on it, because people will be hearing this, though, this is not to say it's not acceptable to question any history on the Holocaust. I don't think he would say of course, that. Of course, of course, but, you know, uh, as someone has said, I, we we don't. This is free speech. People can say what they want. I, I know of no historian who would have uh, anything anything to do with them. Most most of the people who uh, write about this are not historians anyway. Uh, Irving was pretty good. I mean, he knew German. He he could write a lot of uh, interesting stuff. But more and more, his work turned into. Uh, and he's been caught out, as he did in the, in, the, in the libel trial, on a lot of distortions, taking out of context, uh, manipulating numbers and one thing and another. And so there you go. Um, and the, and you're, you're, you're drawing a direct parallel with them and, and people like Dan and Hawk Dawkins and Hitchens. Uh, last chapter is just what's at stake and what were you trying to say to people in that, sir? Well, that's just a, kind of a generally saying, you know, uh, if, we don't, if we don't take history seriously, and I don't expect everyone to be, you know, a card-carrying historian and so on. But we have historical arguments all the time, right? I mean, we about who we are as a people, about the United States, about the Constitution, about the Civil War, uh, and all that. And and history is debatable. I mean, there are lots of different views, and and, and we care about it. So I think it's important to try to establish again and again as much as we can that there are certain boundaries and certain rules by which we try to understand history. Um, and whether it's um, the Civil War or the Founding Fathers or the Holocaust or whatever, we ought to be doing uh, history by uh, an accepted set of rules and not, again, coming in with, with predetermined points of view and then cherry picking for what we think uh, supports those views. So it was it was my last little homily 
on why we should uh, do good history. Well, no, and it's a, it's a good art. I, I, you know, the chapter makes a very good case about rationality and evidence and, and, and all that. Um, I won't hide my fact that I think that you're not going to hear from any of these new atheists because they're not historians, they're propagandists. Well, I think I, I, I agree with you. I mean, they have no interest really in debating history. The, the, in fact, I see uh, a strong correlation between um, uh, anti-religious propaganda from the Nazis, from the fascists in Italy, between the communists in Russia and in China, the anti-religious propaganda is very similar to new atheist material. Yeah, well, I, no, I think that's true. I mean, I guess to try to be fair to the new atheists, I think, well, I, I, I put it this way. <clears throat> uh, I wasn't dealing with, in the book, with the issue of atheism per se. And, uh, you know, we all have friends who are agnostic and atheists and so forth, and um, some of them are good people and some of them aren't. So I don't I don't subscribe to the atheists, the idea that all atheists are evil and they all do evil things and so forth. What I was objecting to is a, is a certain militant form uh, exemplified by the new atheists, very aggressive, uh, as in the Freedom from Religion Foundation and so forth, very aggressive, uh, but full of distortion. Uh, and once again, come back to my original point that these are people who claim, at least in the abstract, to be faithful to reason, and their conclusions are based on evidence. And my book argues this certainly was not true when it came to history. So there's a glaring contradiction between their claim to rationality and at least their practice when it comes to anything that's historical. And that bothered me, made me mad. <laughs> Two more questions, sir, and then we'll, we'll let you get on with your, with your yay. Um, have you play, faced any problems getting any reasonable attention or reviews to your book? Well, a little bit, but part of that was internal to the publisher. Um, I, I had the I had published a book previously with on, on uh, Mussolini with um, with uh, Palgrave, and they did a nice job. But when this book, when they accepted this book, the editor I was working with left in the middle of it, so that was that turned out to be a problem. For example, uh, I, I think the cover has probably got got to be one of the ugliest, most off-putting covers of any book I've seen because they didn't bother. They, I, I'd given them, they ask you to come up with ideas. I'd given them some ideas for a cover. That's sort of an example. So the book sort of fell between the wayside. Then uh, and their, their publicity department, I have to say, wasn't very great. Uh, they didn't follow my suggestions about where they might send the book. And then the whole company got bought up by a German company called Springer. So uh, what I'd, I'd hoped for a little bit more attention in trying to get the book reviewed and so on, which didn't happen. Subsequently, it's picked up a few reviews, and, I, and it has a couple nice five-star reviews on Amazon. But, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's and, and they also uh, originally overpriced it. Um, the hardback edition costs $90. Well, that's ridiculous. What that means is that uh, the universities buy it because they, they buy your books. The publisher gets their money back, and, and that's that. The paperback uh, is more modestly priced, but it's, you know, I don't know what it is now, $32 or something. But so, so anyway, there were, there were problems of that sort that uh, in a better world, it might, might have gotten off to a, a faster start. But anyway, I, I was happy to get it in print anyway. I, I had fun writing it, and I... I had my say, and I'm delighted you found it. <laughs> There's, I, I, I hope people are actually considering, professors are considering using it in a classroom. Um, it is classroom worthy in my view, very much so. I actually wonder how much of the static or, or ignoring of your work in this case is happenstance and how much of it is ideological. Well, you know, I think I think it is. I think um, in the academic world, it's people are a little wary of, of controversy. And I tried to uh, uh, write the book, and I think successfully. With again, it doesn't take up the argument. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a case study, and I was hoping that you know, may, and maybe someone out there has used it. I don't know. In a in a because uh, we used to have a course at Trinity in historiography, the history of history, methods, that sort of thing. Most history major uh, departments have a course like that. But uh, so anyway, maybe maybe it gets used occasionally that way. But that was one of the audiences I had in mind. 
I suspect that the book will find its audience eventually because it's very good. It's also very bruising, but intellectually bruising. It's really a good, strong call to being responsible in history, being responsible on your scholarship, and noting what poor scholarship looks like. Um, I really, I really appreciate the book, and I want to see more people see it. I have one last question, and hopefully it's a fun question. Yeah. What's the question you wish I asked and didn't? Oh, I don't know. You've been very, you've been very, very thorough. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground. And you know, you had written me before and 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 said you had some questions and so on. I think we've covered probably uh, all those. Um, but no, I we've covered the ground, and um, I'm just delighted when anyone takes the interest. I obviously love history and love talking about history. And uh, I, I say I had a lot of fun writing this book because. Um, it um in the particularly the period I was writing it, there were so many book reviews and things that that were coming out that um it kept you know i I had reams and reams of of copied material uh and so on, so I was very happy to to work on it and get it out and very appreciative and grateful to you for noticing and taking the time to talk. Well, I hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you so much for your time, and it, it really is an extraordinary book. I'm going to be recommending it to a lot of people because the fact is that um, for all the answer to the atheist arguments, nobody's gone after them on their dodgy assertions about history, and they make a lot of them, to be blunt, and you've covered a lot of them here. So thank you so much for your time, and you know, God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Painter. I really appreciate okay, your time. Thank you, Max. Okay, thank you, Max. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, bye-bye.